floor. Uh, online, I go by Mellow Mograph. And currently, I'm based out of Portland, Oregon, where I work as a senior motion designer at Wyden and Kennedy. Uh, a little bit of background about myself. I went to school at the University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon, where I was learning a little bit of 3D, mostly digital arts there. And through my time in school, I came across uh, Grayscale Gorilla, which I'm sure a lot of you know of, uh, from a friend. And that's how I discovered Cinema 4D. And so that's been my, my tool of choice ever since. And in the last year, I've used VR to amplify that further. Uh, so with a new presentation, I'd love to share with you a, a brand new reel that I put together. So first thing I want to talk about is my tools of choice. I mentioned that I use Cinema 4D. I've been using that for the last 10 plus years of my career. It's been my, my bread and butter for all my projects, both personal and professionally. Um, I use ZBrush to take some models that I'll want to add extra details to. Uh, ZBrush is incredibly powerful, so I use that for processing more organic models or sculpting in extra details or even doing uh, poly painting or vertex painting. Um, in the last year, I've been using a lot more uh, Substance 3D, specifically uh, Substance 3D Modeler, which launched last fall. And I've been using that as a, it is a VR desktop hybrid modeling solution. And I've been using it primarily on the VR side of things. Um, I'd used a little bit of VR before, but I didn't really get into it until I started it with a Substance Modeler. And then lastly, I'll use uh, Redshift and also the, the Cinema 4D standard renderer. Uh, I use Redshift for my, my nice high-end, uh, photoreal, uh, high-quality rendering. And then I'll use just uh, Cinema 4D standard to do more stylized passes, like halftones and tune shaders and uh, stuff to just give it a little extra flavor. Um, so on that note, why do I use VR? Um, I love using VR because uh, I can, I sometimes will sketch on paper, but a lot of times I'll just do my prototyping and concepting directly in 3D. VR allows me to sketch and create my final all in the same file, essentially. Um, it blurs the line between physical and digital creation because I'm, I like to create things with my hands and VR allows me to create the digital art that I love with my, my hands and my body. Um, I can manipulate forms that I couldn't normally on a, on a standard screen. When you're just using a tablet or just a standard desktop window, you're still moving in a 2D plane, even when you're working in 3D. Uh, with VR, I find that I can actually manipulate. I can take an object, I can grab it, I can pull it any which way. I'm not limited by uh, a screen. Uh, I'm essentially, my face is the camera, and so I can navigate around in a much more organic way. Uh, lastly, I love to use it because I can see my work at any scale. I like to build environments, and sometimes it's cool just to see yourself in that scene with it super blown up so you can actually see what it's like in a final output. Or on a smaller scale, if you're working on product design, you can use it for that to see how big or small you want your final product to be. 
um, as far as Cinema 4D goes, uh, I was really drawn to it because it is the most designer-friendly 3D tool that I've ever used. Um, it's got a lot of great features. The UI, UX design is, is really great. Um, MoGraph, it's in the name. Um, I love using it for motion graphics. And there's a ton of modifiers in there to really amplify your work. Uh, and to that note, the Maxon, the Maxon Noise Library is just phenomenal. There are so many different types of noises that you can use to mix and match, build textures, modify clones, deformers, everything. Um, essentially, it's, it's a great tool to build your animations really quickly, whether it's for product, whether it's building an environment, it's, it's amazing. Um, so to that note, this is what I'm gonna be sharing with today, uh, what I've made. So uh, taking everything that I talked about previously, using VR, MoGraph, Cinema 4D, ZBrush, I'll do a breakdown of how I created this piece. Um, as you can see, there's, there's cloners that drive all the, the placement of the flowers on the tree. Uh, the tree, the flowers, and the bird were all sculpted in VR. Uh, I'm rendering this in Redshift, and I'm even using doing a little bit of 2D MoGraph in the background. Um, so for my piece, I started with a mood board. Um, my favorite bird is a toucan, and it's also spring, so that was a very simple concept to come up with. Um, I'm also a big anime and games nerd, so I wanted to draw from a lot of that inspiration. Uh, more like cute claymation type characters as well. Um, and once I got that figured out, I did a quick sketch on my iPad just to get an idea generally what, what the composition would look like for me. Um, and while I don't have a VR headset to show, with, show you guys today, I did put together a uh, short VR time lapse to uh, demonstrate what that looks like in there before talking about my process in Cinema 4D. Let's get into some files. <clears throat> so that particular project, um, even though it was a quick time lapse, about a minute and a half, the actual time it took to create all three of those pieces was, I'd say about half an hour, 45 minutes, so still incredibly quick. It's another reason why I love using VR to create my content. Uh, so first what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the raw geometry that I got from the VR tool and I'm going to process it in ZBrush and just give it a lot lighter topology, give it some vertex painting so we can bring that into Cinema 4D and render with Redshift uh, and have a lot lighter of a scene file. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to go up to here. I'm going to choose import. And I'm going to grab the, the branches in the clouds that I made. Draw that out. And we're going to go to edit. And I'm going to hit F to focus that up so I can see it a little bit closer. Uh, and the first thing I want to do is I want to break up these three geometry pieces. So I'm going to go down to Subtool. I'm going to hit Split and just do a simple split to parts. And now I can work on each of these parts individually. I'll start with the tree branches. And right now you can see that is super, super dense. That's going to slow our scene down way too much. So let's bring that down just a, just a little bit. And I'm going to do that using zero mesher. So I'm going to come down here. And right now the default is set to five. I think that's going to be a little bit too light. We're going to lose a lot of that detail in there. So I'm going to actually crank this up to 15. And I'm going to turn the adaptive size up. That way there's going to be smaller polygons that are going to be built in those crevices. And then the larger forms are going to have bigger polygons. So it's going to be a lot more efficient. And I'm just going to hit zero measure. We're going to see what that gives us. All right, that's looking great so far. Turn that off. There's a little bit of oddness happening here and down here. And there is a, a nice little fix that I came up with to remedy that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Dynamesh. I'll do a higher resolution just so it maintains that same form. Ooh, that was a little bit of feedback. And I'm going to run Dynamesh. <clears throat> And once I do that, I'm going to go back into zero mesher. And with those same settings, hit it again. We're going to hit D so we can dynamically subdivide it. And we can see now that that's the area that was up there is looking a lot smoother. We're still maintaining that detail, but it's a much lighter model. So I'm going to run through the rest of those files very quickly. These clouds don't have as much detail as the tree, so default zero measure settings are perfectly fine for this. That's looking great. We can actually go a little lighter. Let's go down to one. That's looking great. Let's do control click, alt click, sorry, alt click, and we're gonna select the other sub tool, zero mesh this one. Perfect. And so if we hit D to dynamic subdivide, you can see that it's looking nice and smooth. It still has the same level of detail that I wanted to keep, and it's it's much more production ready. So I'm going to turn this back on. So now that I've got the branches and clouds processed, what I want to do is I want to add some uh, vertex paint to it. So the reason I do this is because when I bring this into Cinema 4D and render with Redshift, I'll take a black and white gradient and I'll remap it into different colors to have a little bit of tonality on each of the pieces of geometry that I bring in. So it's not just a single flat color. So let's start with this cloud since I selected already. I'm going to turn off Z add. I'm going to turn on RGB. And I'm going to turn the stroke option into drag rectangle because I just want to create big patches of gradients that I can blend from uh, white to black. So in this case, I'll actually just so we can see this a little bit better, I'm going to change the shader, the, the matte cap, to the skin shader 4, which is just a nice, simple white shader. And I'm going to click. And, oh, I need to change the color first. So it's going to be default at white. I'm going to choose black for my color. And then I'm going to click and drag 
and bring that out to about halfway. And I'll do a little bit on the tail here. And so that's looking good. There's a little bit of a harsh line right there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna increase the size of my brush, hold shift to smooth. I'm gonna turn off Z add so it doesn't affect the geometry, it just affects the color. And then I'm gonna blend that a little bit more. There we go. And then same thing, I'm gonna do that with the, the rest of the geometry in the scene. So click and drag. Sometimes it'll use the color that you se selected by default until you actually drag on a color and then it'll turn on the, the poly paint function. Drag that in here. Smooth that. And then we're gonna go to the branch. Getting a little crazy here, so I'm gonna refocus. And then I'll click and drag out these gradients down here, up here. And we'll do a little bit of the trunk as well. And then again, we're just doing a little bit of blending to smooth that out. So it's a, a much smoother transition. If you wanna get out of dynamic subdivision, by the way, you can uh, hit Shift D. So D will enable it and Shift D will turn it back off. Uh, but that's our geometry for the, the branches and the clouds. Some folks, including myself too, uh, may want to keep the entire process inside Cinema 4D, or maybe you don't have ZBrush and you only have Cinema 4D. And if you do, that's totally fine too. I'm going to show you how to do the same process inside Cinema 4D next. So I already have a copy of this saved, so I'm just going to not save it. And I'm going to go into a, a new file for cinema. You can hit S to center in on an object that you have selected. Uh, we don't need this normal map or this normal tag, so we're going to get rid of that. And then I'm going to hit Shift C, and this is like the essential tool for Cinema 4D. And I'm going to hit, I'm going to choose Polygon Islands to split that up in the same way that we split it up into subtools in ZBrush. Grab all three of these and drag it out. We can delete that because that's just an empty geometry. And again, super, super dense geometry. We don't want that. We want to we want to be efficient in here. So for this one, I will go down to, I believe it's in subdivision. Oops. And then re remesh. And so last year, the remesh tool got an update and it now has zero mesher built in, which is super fancy. And also the nice thing about it is that you can change your settings on the fly. So right now it has, it's a dense mesh density. I want to go back to polygon count. That's what I had in the previous settings. And while it's thinking about remeshing, I can actually navigate around the scene in real time and work on other stuff if it's like a bigger piece of geometry that needs to process. So there we go. That's a nice clean geometry. Uh, let's put in a couple more of these and I'll set this to 1K. Grab the other cloud, drop it in there. This one, same settings as before, so we'll do 15,000. And turn on adaptive, crank that up. And drop. I put one more remesh in there. Drag that in there. It's going to be, it's going to do a little bit of thinking. There we go. Exactly like what I had in ZBrush. So I'll hit C to bake out these meshes. And now I can use them for vertex painting. So I'll delete that. And I'll just show an example of a vertex painting on the branches so we can move on to the, the good stuff. So 
what I'll do is I'll hit Shift C again, and I'm going to look up vertex color, and I'll drop a vertex color tag on my objects. And when you do that, by default, it's going to also enable the vertex paint tool. I'm going to hold middle mouse, and I'm going to pan around. Um, if you don't see the vertex paint settings right here, you can just do paint tool. There we go. And I'm going to just do simple white. I'll make the size larger. And now I can just paint everything on just as before. And if I want to blend it, same thing in ZBrush. I hit, smooth, I hit shift. Now I can smooth that out. There we go. So there you go. You can do you can do this process in both ZBrush and Cinema 4D. Depends on what tools you have or what your personal pipeline preferences are. Um, next, what I'd like to talk about is how I got the flowers animating on my cherry blossom tree. So for that, I am using uh, MoGraph. And this is a piece of geometry that I've already had poly painted. I've had it processed, so it's got nice, nice clean quads. And it's perfect for animating. Um, so the first thing I did was I used the cloner to create the petals. I had, a, I had five petals in there already that I sculpted, but they were all the same. And so what I did was just deleted one because I had the others as a placeholder. And then I just used the cloner to uh, turn that back on and have four even uh, petals. Um, I'm using the radial option. And because the petals are actually in the exact spot that I want already, I just set the radius to zero and set the clones to five. Uh, the next thing I did was I wanted to have a little bit of uh, fluctuation and movement happening with the petals. And for that, I just took one of the petals and I used a bend deformer. And the bend deformer will affect all the other clones in my object. Uh, for this, I just did a, a simple zero to 30 frame animation. So it starts closed, opens up a little bit, and then it's not doing anything else after that. And the reason why that is is because in my next step, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to add it into another cloner, and I'm going to drive that animation using uh, Maxon noises. So I did the same thing with the, the stamen of the flower, so 0 to 30. I'll just play that so you can see that it just opens and nothing else. So this is the flower. And I'll open up a new scene that has my tree and clouds already in and animated. So we've got a nice blank scene. It's got our cherry blossom trees already animated. That's looking great. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this flower by the root that I created. I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to paste it into here. And that is the right size that I want. That's looking fine. <clears throat> so what I'll do is I'll drop this in another cloner, like so. And I'll do a quick example of what I was talking about when I'm using noise to drive the animation for these flowers before actually applying it to the trees. So what I like to do is, in my new cloner settings, I'll go down to the transform settings, and where it says animation mode, right now it's play. So when it goes from zero to frame 30, it's going to play, and then it's just going to stop immediately. What I'll do is I'll turn this to fixed. And so now, when I play it again, that's not going to do anything. And the reason why it's not going to do anything is because I haven't added any effects in it to drive the animation. In order to do that, I'm going to go up to MoGraph, Effector and shader effector. And there is a, there's a random effector and a shader effector, and they both do a bit of the same thing. The reason why I personally like to use the shader effector is because it allows me to actually create animated loops with my noises. So what I'll do 
is I'll go into the shader effector. Under parameters, I don't need to change the scale. You can keep that the same. And what I'll do is I'll twirl down to time offset. And I'm going to set that to 30. The reason I'm doing that is because that is the last frame of my animation. So when I put in the noise, it essentially is going to take the, the dark values, and that's going to be frame 0. And anything between frame 0, or anything between the dark and the white values is going to be anything from frame 0 to frame 30. So again, it's not doing anything because we don't have a noise, uh, noise set in there. I'll go into the shading tab. I'll choose my shader, and I'll go up to noise. You can already see now that it's changing the stage of the animation. But there's still no animation happening. I'll open this up, and I'll go down to animation speed and loop period. I'll set my animation speed to 1, so it actually will have some movement. And now you can see that when I do that, it's going to start animating those clones individually based on the, the time and the value of the noise. And also, um, this is essentially a, it's like a noise-based pose morph, is what I like to call it. So right now, it's going through this five second animation. And when it reaches frame 150 and snaps back to frame one, it'll snap back the animation. We don't want that. What we want to do is we want to go down to loop period. And this will correlate to the value that you put in here will correlate to seconds. So I'm going to drop in five. And now, when we animate this, we run hit play. Now it's going to do that animation seamlessly. So let's put this on the tree now. What I'm going to do is zoom back out so we can see a little bit more. I'm going, to draw, I'm going to go down to this cloner, and I'm going to change the mode to Object. And in Object, I'm going to assign this branch to that. So it's looking a little funky. That's, that's not what we want yet. So we got to make a couple little adjustments. We're going to change the rotation to negative 90. Yeah, that'll do it. Negative 90. And then we want way more clones than this. So we're going to crank this up to 200. But we don't want all these clones visible. We don't want them all in the trunk area and at the base and all that. We just want it to stick to the branches. And for that, I'm going to use another effector that is just a plane effector to use fields to drive the visibility of those areas. So I'll drop in my plane effector, and we'll turn off all the other parameters, and we'll scroll down and toggle on visibility. So nothing's happening, because right now it assumes that the default value for everything in the plane effector is at 1. And the way we change that is we go into fields. And so what I'll do is I'll drop in a a spherical field. And now everything outside of that sphere is going to be a value of 0, and everything inside is going to be a value of 1. So what I'm going to do next is I will scale this up. And as you can see, flowers are starting to grow back on there. And I will drag this over to here. And populate just these branches. And I want this to also be in other areas too, so I'll make a copy of that field, drop that in, drag that in here. I'm going to go back and bring that up to this area. But it's not showing up. What's going on? What we got to do is we have to add that copied field into our planes uh, tab. So what I'll do is I'll drag this. I'll put it over the top here. Uh-oh. Now it's not showing up in the other area. All you have to do is just change blending and set it to add. And now it's going to be appearing in both those areas. So now when we move this, we got the flowers animating. They're in the right spot. 
there's a little bit of flickering happening because the tree trunk is moving, the fields are staying still. So we'll just drag this into this branch and now those zones will follow the tree. I'm going to turn down the clones just a little bit, just so this, the playback is a little faster. There we go. So let's add a little bit more variety to this. Let's add in a, a random effector. And I'm only using the random effector for static randomization. I'm not using it for animated. So in this particular case, it's perfectly fine. I'm going to turn off position. I'm going to add a little bit of rotation happening along the, um, the axis of the plant. So we'll do that to 360 so it's fully, fully varied. And let's change the scale. We'll do uniform scale. And we're just going to scale this down. We'll use absolute scale. So anything that's randomly scaled up will go like that. If we want to do negative and scale down, we'll do negative 0.5. And there's a lot more variety happening now. Let's add in one more effector. And that is another shader effector. And we're going to drive the swaying of the flowers happening in this. So shader. Uh, we don't need scale. We do want rotation this time. And we want this to rotate on this third axis here. So we'll do something high like 50. And again, we're going to add another noise in this shader. We'll change the seed number so it doesn't have the same pattern that the previous one is happening. Animation speed one, loop period five. Now these flowers have a little bit of swaying happening. It's going a little bit too fast though. So let's, let's tweak a couple options. Let's make the scale a little bit higher or a lot higher. So there's more broad sweeping motions happening. And we're gonna turn down the animation speed to like half that. That's looking a lot better. And again, it's a seamless loop. One more thing I'm gonna add in here is when I bring it into, when I go into rendering, I want to make the flowers have a little bit of variance in their colors. And I'm going to use another plane effector for that. And I'm going to use fields and a noise in the fields to drive that uh, color variety. So turn everything off. I'll keep fields color mode on here. I will use a noise field this time. Or a shader field to drive that. It's gonna turn on this noise option or this color colorize option. Don't need that. And you can see that in the stems, it is, there's a little color variety happening, but it's not happening in the petals. And the way that I've found a fix for this is I just go into this cloner, I make sure that the render instances are turned on, and I bake out that cloner. So what this does is it turns this cloner into a series of instances, but now they can be colorized. So now we've got darker flowers, lighter flowers. Now we can, when we render, we can use that data to drive that variety. Um, so we're going to do that next. So here's our final animation using all the techniques that I shared before, uh, save for animating the toucan character. And there's some fluctuating of the flowers. It's got a nice swaying motion happening. And as I love to see it, it's seamless. Let's open up our Redshift viewport. 
And we're going to see like what this looks like uh, before we apply some materials to it. So in here, I've already added a three-point light. Um, this is usually my my preference for lighting my, my animations. I like to keep it simple, but very photographic. So I've got a main light here, just to flood everything. I've got a, a rim light on the right side that ha highlights a little bit more of that front area. And then I got another one on the back that highlights more of that rear area. And then additionally, I'll do a reflection plane so that anything that is not being lit isn't going to be completely dark and it'll actually it, capture some of that light bounce from the other lights. Um, next thing I'm going to do is I've got these two uh, shaders that I've created uh, in advance and I'm going to show you how I drive, use MoGraph or my vertex painting to drive the color for each of these uh, pieces. Uh, let's start with the toucan. And I'm going to use the, the vertex color material that I created. And we're going to just drop that right on our toucan model. So let's open this up and see what's happening. It's a very simple shader network. All it is is you've got, a, you've got the regular standard material in here. You've got the vertex attribute uh, node. And what I'll do is I'll take the, the vertex, oh geez, <laughs> a little bit of feedback. Um, so what I'll do is I'll take this vertex color tag and I'll drag it in here. And now anything that has the vertex color name as a tag is gonna be driven by this node. Uh, but we don't want this to be just black and white, we want this to have a little bit of color. So that's why I have this ramp node in here. And I plug this into the alt input um, port. And for that, I'll go down and I'll just adjust the color using this ramp down here. So now if we go with like a darker blue, that is gonna be reflected in those darker values. And just for the sake of contrast, let's do like a, a lighter red or a purple for that, that light value, and it's going to appear right there. And if you want to fine tune how that gradient is being driven, you can always go in here and you can change the sliders, have a little harder edge, or if you want, you can even have an extra color in there, like let's just do a green. And it'll do all that mapping for you. Um, so that is the, the standard. That's my standard vertex color driven shader that I like to use. And then I'll play around with like bump and specular and all that just to make sure it fits with the, the part of the, the character that I want, the part of the character that I want to have that like, I want a shiny beak, more matted feathers, et cetera, et cetera. This other shader though has one little extra thing going on here. And that is this color user data node and what that is used for is that will take the MoGraph color data that I had in my cloner, and then it will multiply that using this color layer node with the vertex colors that I uh, assign here. This particular shader is gonna go right in my flower cloner right here. As you can see, there's not a whole lot happening. What you will notice though is that the um, the middle to the outer part of the flower is going from black to white, and that's because of the vertex color data in here. And then the color user data from MoGraph is going to be determining whether these are lighter or darker. But these are sakura plant; these are sakura flowers, so let's make them pink and not just black and white. So we're going to go with a darker pink for here. Right in there. And then just a, just a lighter, a softer pink right here. And those are the flowers. You can see that there's a little, like, like lighter ones here, there's darker ones there. And I just like to do that to break up the, 
the, the colors a little bit and not have it just be, again, like a single flat color. Um, let's, let's change up the, the toucan a little bit though. Let's, let's give him more of a natural color or more of the color the, to, the to the final. So I had like a darker blue to more of like a like a lighter blue purple color. And then we're gonna take a copy of this and let's use this one to color the beak. So we'll make this more of a, a reddish orange. And we'll do more of a, a yellow right here. And then we're gonna drop that on top of our toucan. But now it's all orange, we don't want that. I have a bunch of selection tags that I created when I was processing this model. So I have a beak top, beak bottom, belly, face, et cetera, et cetera. So we're just gonna go in here. And I'm gonna find that beak top, which is right here, drag that down. And now we've got that beak colored indep independently. Uh, we'll copy this color over, and we're just gonna change that tag to beak bottom. And let's do it one more time, and let's find our feet. I oh, know I don't have a feet one in here. I think I have it colored with something else. Uh, let's do the belly instead. So take another copy of this. We'll make this just like a, a light, like a white to a uh, yellow. So white, do like a yellowish orange, kind of like how a, a toucan's neck or belly actually looks. Drag that in. And we're going to go to our, oh, there is claws. <laughs> Drag that on there. Now you can see we're progressively building on these uh, textures and materials onto the scene. Once we've got that, uh, that's pretty much it for the, uh, the 3D side of things. But what I also like to use uh, C4D as well is I like to do 2D motion graphics with it. Um, so if you saw in the reel, I had some animated pedals flying in the background of that. And that is using a same workflow that I used for the pedals on the, or the flowers on the tree, but just in 2D. So I'll open that up and I'll show you what that looks like. And we've got the petals falling. It's just a simple black and white map. And again, it's another, we don't need this because it's not rendering in Redshift. This is just a standard render that I did. So just a nice, simple petal fall happening there. I'm using one shader effector to drive the position of the flowers. So this is what it looks like on its own. This is what it looks like with that turned off. And then I'm adding a rotation just to give it more of like a, a rocking motion of these flowers as they're falling diagonally. And then the way I have this set up as a loop is I've got my cloner that has all the petal geometry that I built. And then I have that inside another cloner. So this is what it looks like without the extra loop. And then when I turn that on, I'm just creating copies on either side of the main uh, cloner. And then I'm, doing, I'm driving the speed based on how far they're spaced out. And so I render that out as a flat plate. I, I can use that as a mask or just as a blend effect on top of that. And the end result will look like this. Leave that playing for a second. So there you go. One thing I didn't add is that uh, I'm just using another type of noise to add these uh, tree branch like lines in there. And that's just adding that into that color 
uh, that color layer you know, that I had in the Redshift material. Um, but that's it. That's how I created this piece using uh, VR, Cinema 4D, and Redshift. <laughs>